Since the COVID outbreak started, uh, the vaccine uh, debate has been ongoing. People trying to predict when we're going to have a vaccine. But certainly that conversation um, has picked up quite a bit in the news lately. Even this morning, we all woke up to find out that one of the vaccine trials has been put on hold for an adverse event. So we are so fortunate to have two experts here that can help inform us along the way. And hopefully this is just the beginning of a conversation. So first I'm gonna start with Bart Haynes, who as you all know, is director of our Human Vaccine Institute. So Bart, you've had an opportunity to look at some of the preclinical science. It's quite extraordinary that some of that's coming out as we're in phase three testing. But if you look at that, what can you tell us about how confident you are that at least some of the vaccine strategies should be promising? Well, that's a good question. And uh, most of the preclinical data, of course, has been in animal models. The, the good news is, is that SARS-CoV-2 challenges of um, animal models vaccinated with the, many of the current vaccines um, uh, has, have, have shown protection uh, induced by those vaccines with so-called neutralizing antibodies. And so that's very good news. The caveat is, is that we don't yet have an animal model that exactly replicates the disease in humans. And so it can repli replicate acquisition of SARS-CoV-2 and very mild symptoms, um, but uh, can't uh, replicate the disease. Now there are other animal models that are being developed um, and these should come on uh, later this fall and the first of 2021 uh, from what we've seen of, of what's being developed. But I think the news is good in that uh, the neutralizing antibodies that have been isolated from people who are infected and the neutralizing antibodies that have been induced, induced by vaccines are easy to induce compared to say a very difficult uh, uh, disease problem like HIV where those antibodies don't want to be induced. This is not what we're talking about here. This is much more like Zika or uh, other um, or, uh, other types of infections. So the hopes are is that some of these vaccines are going to be protected. Well, that is good news. But as we learn more about the basic science of the virus, particularly as some of the sequencing data now um, is becoming more widely available, is there anything that gives you some concern that um, the magic bullet may not be there? Well, the concerns are, number one, escape. This is an RNA virus. It is mutating, but the good news is it's very slowly mutating. It's not mutating even as fast as influenza and certainly nowhere near what HIV does. And, um, but escape mutants can occur. And so we're worried about that. And one of the things the Vaccine Institute is working on is to design vaccines that can work even with escape mutants. Secondly, we're worried about durability of the response. There are now reports out that people can become infected a, a second time, very rare cases of this where it's been documented. But we're c concerned that the antibodies may not last as long as we would like them with vaccines. And so uh, another issue is to develop vaccines that have longer durability than are, are currently being um, looked at. The third thing is potency and that uh, we're worried that the vaccines may not be strong enough to protect in humans like they can in the animal models. And so that's another issue we're looking at. And finally is safety. And you alluded to this, that the recent um, pause of the AstraZeneca trial is causing great concern. Uh, there are animal models with SARS and MERS, also coronaviruses, that when uh, you, certain vaccines are used, cause a worse disease, uh, an enhanced disease, um, uh, than, um, rather than protection. And so we're really worried about uh, making sure that the phase three clinical trials are carried all the way through and the full 15,000 people who receive the vaccine versus the 15,000 that don't receive the vaccine. And so the safety can be adequately monitored in this number of people. And then finally, Plans are already in place by the CDC and the FDA to look at a post uh, um, 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 approval surveillance in order to continue to look at safety on the long term because this vaccine is going to be given to a lot of people. Well, I think all of us would agree that science should drive the process, but as Mark can attest to, um, science is part of the process. And then there's policy and implementation and then 
politics and all that is coming to play. So I often think of you and what if you were still the FDA director? What would you be thinking about um, in this current climate? Well, it's a very challenging time to be uh, the, the commissioner at the FDA. You know, we're dealing with, uh, um, in many ways, unprecedented pandemic. Fortunately, there, there is some good, promising news coming along. We're certainly not there yet on a vaccine. We're certainly not there yet on community control, even though Duke has made some tremendous progress. I think it's, by the way, setting a national standard for how to reopen a school effectively with a combination of mitigation measures, engagement of the community, and testing. Um, but we're, 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 we still have a long ways to go uh, in, in the pandemic. And we're coming up on a very contentious election. And so obviously there's a, a lot of politics around this too. What's most important for FDA is to, uh, for leading FDA is remember that there is a career staff and an established uh, uh, body of regulatory science that is not only replicable to, uh, or, or applicable to the COVID-19 context, but which the, the career staff has actually taken a lot of additional steps in this unprecedented time to make a, a, as much clarity as possible around what should happen in the regulation of vaccines. So FDA participated in an international effort early on in uh, 2020 to lay out conditions for moving vaccines into human testing, taking account of, as best we knew it then, the kinds of factors and, and issues that, that, that Bart was just describing and, and uh, animal testing and, and pre-human uh, 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 evaluation. In June, FDA came out with an excellent, very specific guidance document for the manufacturers of vaccines on what FDA is looking for, especially in these pivotal clinical trials that are ongoing now. What they're looking for in terms of an impact on the uh, incidence or the rate of uh, uh, patients in the trials getting COVID infections and the severity of those infections to get to approval. They're looking for a minimum effect of 50% uh, reduction in some combination of those two hard endpoints. And that was used in the design of these clinical trials along with paying attention to issues like um, uh, adverse immune reactions or whatever else. And at this point, I don't think we know actually caused that uh, uh, halt and uh, temporary pause at least in the uh, AstraZeneca the trial in England. Um, at the same time, there also is parallel work going on with manufacturers jointly investing with the federal government in large-scale production for seven of these vaccines, even before we know whether they work or not. So there will be minimal delay between when FDA makes regulatory decisions and when the vaccine can start to become available as appropriate to the public. So there is a strong foundation to build on, Mary, but uh, unfortunately there's been a lot of con confusion created by some of the, the, the political debates and statements around this. Um, what my job would be as FDA commissioner and what we're trying to do in our role at, at Duke Margolis in collaboration with other former commissioners like, um, uh, like uh, Rob, Rob Califf is to help FDA get its, um, uh, educate the public and the expert community about what goes into these decisions and, and hopefully they'll, they will be followed. I have a lot of confidence in the FDA professional staff and I also have a lot of confidence in the end that this is gonna be the path forward. Um, the, uh, manufacturers of vaccines came out earlier this week saying that they want to follow the FDA process. Um, I think that's the only way to really get to, uh, to, to broader acceptance by the public, which is going to in turn depend on broader acceptance by the clinical expert community that they're going to listen to about um, what they should do with regard to the vaccine. So lots of difficult issues ahead there, but from an FDA standpoint, you've got a good foundation to build on. We just need to make sure we follow through on that. That was an extraordinary move that the major, the leaders of the major pharmaceutical companies that are all involved came together and committed to letting the science really drive the process. Yeah. That being said, there's a couple of challenges. First, with a vaccine, safety bar is so much higher than with a therapeutic. And how do you have that as a high bar and have emergency use approval. I mean, that to me seems really challenging. Uh, it, it is a question that a lot of people 
rightly have, especially after they've seen FDA use its emergency use authorization authority for a couple of treatments, uh, including earlier this year, hydroxychloroquine, more recently, remdesivir and convalescent plasma, where the evidence has been limited. You know, I, I personally find the, the remdesivir evidence pretty conclusive for hospitalized patients. So that's become you know, the standard of care um, for uh, convalescent plasma. It's really iffier, but this is a, a good illustration, Mary, of how FDA applies its, its fairly broad emergency use authority differently in different circumstances. So Convalescent plasma is a product that's been around for a while. It's been used, uh, like Bart was saying, um, you know, this is not new science for treating um, infectious diseases. It's been used for 100 years. Um, it's been used in thousands of patients with COVID with generally a very good safety record. Um, so not a lot of concerns like we have with vaccines and healthy people when uh, this product is being used in hospitalized patients. Now on the benefit side, unfortunately, there hasn't been any good randomized trials completed. Uh, there's several underway. We don't have results back in. My guess is if, the, if it was a slam dunk, uh, we would have had a result uh, reported out from a DF, D, DSMB um, and, and kind of early news about it that hasn't happened, even though this has been is being studied and has been studied for a while, like in the recovery trial in, in England. Right. So there rightly are concerns by health professionals about the limited evidence and you know, whether it should be used. In an ideal world, we get randomized trial evidence on it. I, in any case, I don't think it's gonna be a game changer, but, but I'm personally not very concerned about the safety issues there. It's a very different circumstance when FDA uses its emergency use authorization authority for a vaccine that is right. potentially gonna be given to hundreds of thousands if not millions of people who are mostly healthy, mostly don't have not only serious COVID, but don't have any infection at all. That's why vaccine safety standards, as you mentioned earlier, are always high. And FDA has a track record of EUA use for vaccines, which is very different from the convalescent plasma case I was just talking about a minute ago. And in particular, in that FDA guidance that I mentioned from back in the uh, earlier this summer, FDA said they were looking for evidence on the actual clinical endpoints, these hard endpoints of reductions in infection rates and reductions in infection, you know, meaningful reductions in infection severity, like not getting hospitalized uh, nearly as frequently before they would take any action on an EUA. Uh, FDA also said, again, different from the case with um, remdesivir convalescent plasma, that they would want to have a public uh, input process with this using their advisory council, uh, ad advisory committee for vaccines, using a presentation from the company asking for the emergency use uh, and FDA's response to that all in public uh, before this would go forward. So I do see a potential role for emergency use authorization for vaccines, maybe for military personnel, for healthcare professionals in at-risk circumstances, but not if FDA's uh, biologic center guidance is followed, not before we have actual hard clinical endpoint evidence from these phase three trials that are underway now. There is still a process, you, know, you might say, well, isn't that what's needed for approval? There are some additional steps that are needed to get from having all the data uh, and some fairly clear conclusions that would be satisfactory for a DSMB, uh, satisfactory for, you know, this kind of public discussion and getting all the way to approval. It's a more comprehensive process, involves very extensive review of the data uh, and so forth. Um, but I could see a pathway to doing that. It's one that, as you said, we're going to need more transparency as data becomes available and more engagement of the clinical community before it will be uh, something that I think the, the, the broader public is going to accept. So for either one of you, is there any precedent for an EUA type approval of a vaccine versus a therapeutic? Uh, Bart, did you want to comment on that? Or well, I, 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 I think uh, Ebola comes to mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And, um, uh, I, you know, I think the, uh, uh, the trials, if they're allowed to go, um, they're moving very quickly. The enrollment is moving very fast. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, this is, uh, in the context of the scale and the circumstance in a global pandemic, uh, uh, quite, quite unprecedented with regard to modern vaccinology, and we're learning a lot as we go along. 
um, the safety issues are profound. And um, as I said, that's highlighted today with this case of what's called inflammation of the spinal cord or transverse myelitis in a person. It could be true, true, and unrelated, but um, uh, inflammation of the spinal cord has been recorded with other vaccines and the syndrome mm -hmm. called Guillain-Barre syndrome. So it causes great concern and pausing was certainly the right thing to do. Um, so I mentioned post um, approval surveillance. We're gonna be studying these vaccines for a long time. They may go in, in, in as right. many as a billion people uh, or more. And so um, this is, this is at, on scale quite, quite unprecedented. I mean, the other evidence that we, that the industry is committed to doing this right is the focus on really engaging and enrolling diverse population in the studies, which on one hand slows down the study, but really is the appropriate way to study both efficacy well, and safety. Well, the trials are, are also starting to enroll older individuals. And as, right. as we all know, older individuals are much at risk for uh, more severe COV-2 and uh, the immune systems and with other vaccines of older individuals may not perform as well as uh, immune systems of younger individuals. And so the vaccines may not be as immunogenic. And so doing those studies, and there are also studies that we're involved in with regard to looking at the response of older primates versus younger primates, et cetera, to try to get data before the efficacy trials are out to try to figure out what some of the problems might be. Yeah, there, as, so as Bart said, there is a precedent for using emergency authorizations. Um, recently, not so much in the US where we haven't had an outbreak quite like this, but you know, think for uh, Ebola outbreaks and ring vaccinations around the outbreak areas. And, and I think if there were an emergency authorization, which would not come until after there is clear data for months. Remember, these are mostly these early vaccines or two dose vaccines. So that's a couple of months to just dose the patients in the trial, 30,000 uh, minimum in, in uh, these uh, early trials. The J&J &J trial is going to be, I think, 60,000. Um, other evidence coming in similar trials outside the U.S., like the, the one that uh, we, we've just been discussing, uh, the AstraZeneca one in England that had the, um, the uh, potential adverse event. So that's a, that's a pretty good safety base a database uh, as well as affecting this database before approval. And even then, um, I think there, there is going to need to be uh, some extensive discussion to get to a level of comfort with um, the data, the evidence, and I think FDA is building that into their process. Um, one other thing to think about with the uh, emergency use is if you think about like in kind of just continuing the what's the equivalent of the Ebola analogy here? Well, it's probably um, uh, healthcare personnel that are, that are very much at risk. It might be military personnel since it's a national security issue potentially. Um, emergency use done right would significantly expand the, the, the safety uh, database before uh, there is very broad access for the, for the public. And I think whatever happens, it's likely that we're gonna see kind of phased um, uh, decisions by the FDA, potentially by the, the CDC. CDC is also committed to have a meeting of their advisory committee on immunization practices, ACIP, before uh, there's any kind of uh, broad use of the vaccine. We may well see a, a phased approach for the reasons that Bart mentioned. The effectiveness may be different in different groups. And by the way, the trials going on now aren't even focusing on children at all since they're kind of at lower risk, you know, the benefit risk uh, um, uh, equation is different for them. It really is more about um, elderly patients, patients with comorbidities, patients from communities of color, others that have been uh, disproportionately affected. So this is gonna be an ongoing process. And I think it'd be very important that FDA, and back to your original question, FDA commissioner and all of us in the public health and policy community should be urging following these, um, I think these, this very good uh, pathway that the FDA career staff has laid out to develop the evidence, get the evidence out there for, for broader discussion as a way to guide what will probably be a stepwise path forward for, for vaccine use. Yeah. Well, Bart, Mark, we are so lucky to have you here, but more importantly, our country is lucky to have you as really valued voices of science and policy truth. And I'm gonna be calling on you all fall to, to talk to our community. Thank you so much.